Man City versus Villa. David James comes up for a corner and out of nowhere, <laughs> leapt like a salad. A leapt salad? Like a, a salad? A salad? <laughs> salad. <laughs> a salad. <laughs> a salad. <laughs> In wet lettuce. <laughs> Hello and welcome to The Rest is Football with me, Gary Lineker, Alan Shearer and Micah Richards. Uh, gents, I hope you all both well enjoyed your exciting weekend of uh, FA Cup action. And before we start, Alan, before we start, I am not going to mention the fact, right, that you've never won the FA Cup. I'm not going to mention <laughs> not one time that you never won the FA Cup. So as long as we've got that clear. I can see on here that I can't see on the BBC. Fuck off. <laughs> <laughs> That's what I wanted to see on the core comms when you came to me yesterday. <laughs> yeah. how, was, how, how difficult was it to resist Swery Al? Very. Yeah. <laughs> Sorry, you carry did well, on. Actually, you did 90 minutes football plus a bit of injury time without a, with, with that one single F-bomb. <laughs> uh, which was, well, it can be controlled. Yeah, uh, Mike, you were at Middlesbrough the the, the Middlesbrough Villa game. Yes, it uh, didn't look a thriller. I was. It wasn't a thriller. I was really impressed with Middlesbrough and the way they defended Carrick, and it was really good. The tactics and the way so they went the three at the back and then two wing backs and then the midfield made like a, a box and there was just basically saying to Villa, you're going to play wide. And then there was flooding the box and then Villa just couldn't break him down. It took a, a wicked deflection from um, Matty Cash's strike that got him the win. But um, yeah, it wasn't a thriller to say the least. No. Um, Alan, did you, did you go to the um, Newcastle Sunderland game? Or no, Newcastle? I didn't. Uh, you weren't, I couldn't you take the telly. chance. I might not have been let out alive if I'd got to Sunderland. <laughs> I was <No>. wondering. Um, <laughs> I watched it in a pub with my pals. Yeah. And um, is that shirt still on you? The, the, um, they plonked a Sunderland shirt, didn't they, on your statue? <laughs> statue. Yeah, I saw that, yeah. <laughs> it did make me laugh, some of the stuff on the uh, on the socials uh, before the game, yeah. Um, but it was a good day for Newcastle. It was a really, really important win. I mean, it was it was men against boys, really, from start to finish. They couldn't... Um, Sunderland rolled out the red carpet all week for the Geordies. They wanted to make the stadium light feel like home for Newcastle. They certainly did that. They allowed 6,000 fans in and um, they had a great time in Newcastle battered Sunderland. So the pictures that we, we that were surfacing the internet, mainly on Instagram, and were they actually real pictures? Was, was yeah. someone not taking the mick? Sunderland did that themselves. I when I saw those pictures, Micah, I thought, oh, some of the Geordies have like broken so into the I. stadium light and decorated the room that was um, that was going to be theirs. Sunderland Football Club actually did it themselves. I mean, can you believe? Do you want to explain what those pictures were for for those that like me that don't know what the hell you're talking about? Well, because <laughs> new, usually I think in a in a league game Newcastle would be lucky if they got fifteen hundred two thousand tickets because it was an FA Cup game. It was agreed that Newcastle got six thousand tickets, so they had to give Newcastle a whole end, mm. and in that end was a bar, which obviously was going to be taken over by the Newcastle fans. So the Sunderland actually Sunderland Football Club somehow thought it was a good idea to decorate the bar out in black and white and say, welcome <laughs> to the Jordan. Can you believe that? It's like, oh That's my God. That's a really God. lovely touch, isn't it? Oh, Jesus, honestly, you couldn't make it up. And then they realised that they'd made a monumental error and had to apologise to the Sunderland fans who put out a statement. <laughs> oh, God, what that was fucking thinking? stupid. <laughs> That's brilliant. Uh, also, yeah. I, I must say though, I think that red and white stripe suit you, Al. Yeah, right. Or <laughs> <laughs> only at Southampton did it. Yeah, we were both at the um, Emirates. Um, we're, we're recording this on Monday morning. We were both at the Emirates uh, yesterday early evening, and and uh, I, I can safely say, Alan, you had a much better view of the game than we did in the studio. It yeah. is the Arsenal studio. I think is which for a, new, a relatively new ground. It's the worst. You can't yeah. see half of the pitch. It's um, terrible, isn't it? Yeah. Um, so come on, Arsenal Football Club. We know what a great club you are and great fans and great place to play football. Um, but, I mean, Tottenham's 
Tottenham's TV studio in their ground. They oh. thought about it. It's the best in football anywhere. Anywhere. It's one big glass square. You can see yeah. all the pitches sideways on. Arsenal, get your act together on that uh, particular <laughs> front and p- possibly uh, on the field as well. They're lacking a little bit at the moment, Alan, particularly um, up front. They, I mean, they played really well first half. Well, they played really well in, until they got to the final third, um, which is the, the most important. Um, there's nothing unlucky about missing so many chances. It's about ability. And that's what Arsenal are lacking and that's what's going to cost them. Unless they get someone in, which is going to be really difficult, uh, to put the ball in the back of the net, then I doubt they'll get what they want this season. Um, they might have to wait a little bit longer because it's the most it's the most important, it's the most difficult. I said it yesterday on the core comms that you have to have someone who can put it in the back of the net. The, uh, I know that Chelsea, when Chelsea had it, they didn't. They had Lampard, but he was brilliant at it. Man City, Gundogan, he was brilliant at it. Um but they've they've moved on since then, and particularly City in terms of getting Haaland. But everyone else has to contribute, and that's not quite happening at Arsenal this season at this moment in time, and that's going to cost them. I mean, the chances that they missed was just uh, terrible. What I don't understand about Arsenal is Havertz is a very good player, and I'm actually one of the people who think he's he's he can fit into a system. And he can look very well. I think his touch is good. I think the way he opens up, the way he wants to pass, I think he slows it down at times. But we all could see, and we were saying it from last season, even 18 months ago, that Arsenal need a striker. You've got 60 million for a player who, no disrespect, if I'm looking at Smith Rowe, I know he's had his injuries, he can do the job that Havertz can do, in my opinion. So that 60 million has to be invested in a forward player. We know what Jesus can do in, in a forward role. We know Nketiah towards, that last end, uh, towards the end of last season played very well uh, as well. But you're thinking, you're up against Liverpool and, and Man City, who have got firepower, striker had to be the priority for me, and now you're seeing in these little moments, the game yesterday was so evident when he just needs someone to have a cool head in front of goal. At this moment in time, Arsenal have not got there. Yeah, but they had Nketiah and Trossard on the bench <laughs> and didn't use them yeah. until really, really late on, which I was really surprised about. I mean, whatever you think about whether they think they're good enough or not to take them where they want to go. They did have those two on the bench and didn't use them until very late on. We've been having conversations, haven't we, over the last few weeks about who they could possibly sign in the transfer window. But it's it's becoming increasingly um, apparent that it looks like um, FFP, financial fair play, um, is restricting them from um, being able to plunge into that transfer market in this particular window. Uh, yeah, and whoever they're looking at, their price is going up by the million every day. Because everyone knows Arsenal are desperate for a centre forward. FA Cup third round. Um, I, I think it's always one of the best weekends of the, of the season. Um, you know, you get potential upsets. You, 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 t- you know, the top teams go to places where they wouldn't ordinarily play. Um, you usually get one. It's not been a weekend of um, huge upsets. Um, uh, did were you ever on the end of an upset? Either of you two? Not a big one. I mean, we. <clears throat> I went to Stevenage with Newcastle. Um, which got a bit bitter and nasty. Uh, we went there and we drew, and then we brought them back to St James's Park, and they gave us an almighty scare. We got through by the skin of our teeth in the end, but I can't think of too many big upsets, no. I was nearly on the end of one. We was playing Wickham away. and um, Who for? For Aston Villa. And we went there and the confidence in the dressing room was was low. We wasn't doing very well within the league and we just needed this result. And we we managed to actually draw the game. But do you remember scenes of me going over to speak to the fans years and years and years ago? Oh, that one. Do you remember it, yeah? The one you talked about in, in previous pod when you... In, in previous Reasoning pods, with the fans. Yeah. Reasoning with the fans and... <laughs> I remember on the on the sideline, we used to play this game with, with chewing gum. And I wasn't playing it. And you had the chewing gum. What? And, yeah, it's ridiculous. I know. <laughs> when, when, you're on the, when you're on the bench, it's boring. Yeah. 
And I remember like, <laughs> jo- Jolian was on the bench. I was actually playing this game, but Jolian was on the bench and he was throwing chewing gum. And like the fans caught wind of, of the subs, like just throwing chewing gum. It was almost like, do you remember that game where you have to throw like a, a pound or a penny to the wall and who could get it closest to the wall? You so we used to play to the touch it. Line. Yes, so we was playing like, who could get it closest to the touchline? And the fans, see what they was doing? So then oh, the fans was giving jo- Jolian dogs abuse. Like, what are you doing? Not even concentrating on the game. If you don't want to be here, <laughs> get lost, get out of our club. So I go and reason with the, with, with the fans, which I've spoken about before. And then there's another video that not a lot of people have seen. As we're walking back after the game towards the coach, the abuse we're getting is absolutely horrible. And I was like to the guys, and I was captain at this point. I was captain. Captain and you know, chewing gum. <laughs> but you know, <laughs> you guys have been leaders of teams, the players that you that you were. But everyone was looking at me for advice. And I was like, I don't know what to say to you because... I'm not particularly playing well. The team's not playing well. I'm supposed to be the leader and I'm getting dogs abuse from the fans. And it was just a moment where I thought, maybe it's time for me to retire because I'm not, I'm not at the level required. It was just strange times at Villa. But luckily we won the replay. Thank God for that. I lost a, a, a cup tie against non-league opposition. Really? Yeah. For who? For Leicester. Oh, well, I was okay. only I was only about eighteen. Oh, oh look at him! I was only about. Eight. No one asked you what age you were. <laughs> getting in the excuses already. You're just getting the excuses already. I can no excuses. I'm well. There are going to be a lot of excuses, but um, <laughs> I'm just filling in the detail. That's all. I was just breaking into Leicester team. The first game we played was at Filbert Street, and they managed to get a two-two draw. I wasn't playing. I was in the stand. I'd only I'd only played a handful of games for Leicester at that stage. And then the replay was the the, the following Wednesday away, Harlow, and um, tiny little ground. And we travelled down there, and I wasn't feeling well, very well at all. I had tonsillitis, terrible. I used to get it a lot. I know Alf suffers from it as well, yeah. didn't you? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And yeah. Um, it was awful. I was in a really, I was aching all over, and I thought, well, it's, I'll just. And I was so terrified of the Leicester manager, Jock Wallace, that. I didn't. I didn't say anything. I just kind of sat there, shivering, shivering, and knowing that I wasn't going to play anyway. So we get to the ground, and we're all sitting around the dressing room, and I'm in the corner, like <sighs> feeling really cold and aching, and my throat's terrible. And he reads the team out, and he goes, "And um, playing on the right wing, uh, Linica." So I've gone, "Oh my." God, no, oh no, do I tell him? I just didn't have the nerve to tell him. I went out, I, I was an absolute shambles. Okay. <laughs> and um, we ended up losing, um, we ended up losing 1-0. Um, but it was, a, it was a magical day for them. I, and, you know, so I think we're in the, I think we're in the old second division at the time. I might be wrong. Um, but it was, yeah, uh, a, an awful experience. Brilliant. What goes through your mind when you've lost to a team you should be at that level. No. You know, the magic of the cup and all and all them sort of it's, things. It's embarrassing, isn't it? That's the thing. It's the embarrassing. I mean, you know, we everyone wants the underdog to win anyway, don't they? If, you, if you're a neutral, let's say, you're watching the game, you want them to win. But when it's you that are the bigger club, um, you know, and you, and you get beaten like that, and you know, you get all the piss taking from the crowd, don't they? And all, the, all this stuff. I just think it's, it feels mildly humiliating um but you also recognize that it's 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 a wonderful day for them not that you give the monkeys about that at the time it's just <laughs> i just think it's embarrassment i think that's the the biggest thing and um and you feel like you've let your supporters down under those circumstances. i think it's one of the best weekends of the uh, of the season i do i know <clears throat> you're right i mean if i correct me if i'm wrong but i don't think there's been a premier league team knocked out yet a couple of replays yeah. um but there's not other than Maidstone, wasn't yeah. it? Um, Wrexham won at Shrewsbury and they were a division above them, but you wouldn't call that a massive shot because Wrexham are flying at the near the top of um, League Two. Um, that's a derby as well, isn't it, really? That, that, um, Shrewsbury and um, Wrexham. 
but no, not 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 too many shocks uh, in this particular game. But Micah, Micah, <laughs> you've you've been very modest, haven't you? About what? You omitted one thing. You told us about the chewing gum and all that, but you didn't tell us who scored the Aston Villa goal <laughs> against Wickham. Well, like you said, I'm just warming up, you know. I, I thought I'd leave that for a little bit later. Yeah. Did you? Of course I scored. I slowed oh, it. It was a lovely God. finish. Absolutely <laughs> brilliant. I remember it on match of the day, Alan Hansen. <laughs> basically... I was overweight then. Not overweight, but I would I put on Similar a few, to now know, then. the muscle. <laughs> 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 I'm back in my early days, I was, I was slim, I was slender, I was up and down. But I was in that position where I was, I was sort of in between centre-back and right-back. And in this game, I was brilliant. I was marauding. I was ferocious, crosses into the box, everything. <laughs> But my recovery runs were pathetic. <laughs> and I just remember like Alan Hansen saying, oh, he was excellent going forward. This is the four we all love. And then he showed a clip at the end of me like jogging back in position. And it was like I was carrying a weight vest to trying to get back in. I just, oh. But yeah, I actually played well in that game. But, you know, I don't like to mention it. <laughs> love it. Well, well done. What a hero. Um, <laughs> The FA Cup, I, I mean, obviously it's not quite um, the competition it was. I mean, it's still, I mean, players still want to win it. There's no question about that. But you, going to the time when I grew up, as a kid, and I think this was widespread, you grew up wanting to win the FA Cup. You didn't grow up dreaming about winning Division One or the Premier League as it is nowadays. You grew up dreaming about winning the FA Cup. It was the biggest show in town and you, it's, it was the one game you'd sort of watch live every year was the FA Cup final and, and that's, yeah. that's what you've dreamed of, of winning. It, it's changed somewhat, but it's still got an element of, of, of the magic, hasn't it? Mainly, I, I, I would suggest, because of the history of the, the competition. Yeah, I think it's without doubt, it's still magic. Um, I mean, I, I love this this weekend uh, as as much as any weekend, just because of the small clubs go against the big boys, and there's always an opportunity. Um, but yeah, it, it has lost a little bit, only because of the might of the Premier League and the might and the wealth of mm. the Champions League yeah. that the big clubs would prefer, or their priority is the league, Champions League. Um, but I think to other clubs, I know it's survival to stay in the Premier League. But it's it's still magical. There's no doubt about it. It's it's still huge, and I do I do like it when I hear foreign managers. I mean, Jurgen Klopp said about how he loves the FA Cup and how in Germany they all look to it and 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 wish that they could have something like that in in their country. Um, so, and I I do enjoy it when I hear people say that because yeah, I was I was brought up that. You, all day Saturday, from Saturday morning, you watched the um, the beginning of it. You watched the coaches coming through. You watched the game and everything else after it. I mean, it was all day. And it's, yeah, it's slightly different now, but I still think it's magical. Yeah, the, yeah. the FA Cup made me, didn't it, really? That uh, that moment, Man City versus Villa, uh, ball comes in, David James comes up for a corner, and out of nowhere, <laughs> leapt like a salad. A salad? A salad? A salad? Wet lettuce. <laughs> <laughs> leapt like a salad. <laughs> I love that. <laughs> <laughs> I oh, left like a, sa a salmon. A salmon salad. <laughs> <laughs> I left. It was one of the best leaps of my life. And that moment was just incredible, jumping into the fans. And then from that day, everyone, my life changed. Everyone on who I was and everyone was saying, oh, needs that riches to be played for Man City. And I played a lot of games towards the end of that season. And the season after, I was starting every week. So... It can make dreams come true. The salad's changed his life. Yeah. What was the dressing on the salad? <laughs> <laughs> Creosote. 
<laughs> oh man, stop it! I've got so sore You're making me I'm clear. <laughs> oh, I don't know about you two, but I need a break. Welcome back to the Resty Salad with Micah Richards, uh, Alan Shearer, and me, Gary Lineker. Uh, <laughs> that's my favourite moment of the year so far. Oh, I know it's early God. January, but um, um, Micah, did you realise that when Villa won on Saturday, the previous captain to have won a cup tie was your good self Ooh. at Aston Villa, which was back in 2016. In the Wickham replay. I, I didn't want to mention it. I marshaled the defence to a clean <laughs> sheet, as as usual. Uh, Kieran Clark scored late doors in that game. But I just remember the atmosphere because, again, I said before, it was tough because we wasn't playing well at all. And the, the crowd was, was jeering and sighing and we wasn't playing the best. But then Kieran Clark open the scoring then. I think it was Adrissa Garner Gay who got the second to take us through. But yeah, it was uh it was bleak times around then. Gary. I think you're dressing things up a little bit. <laughs> <laughs> Back to the actual games themselves and um Newcastle's win at Sunderland Alan it it was obviously it's important in terms of um, local bragging rights, but it's it's also important for Newcastle because it kind of, you would think it perhaps ends that sticky patch that they've been going through. Yeah, not not just the result, Gary. Um, it's a I think it was also about the performance for Newcastle because they haven't played well of late. They haven't defended well of late. Um, they've looked really poor in in most areas of the field. Um, so I think it was it was really important that they had a really good all round performance, and that's exactly what it was. Great for Eddie, hopefully great for confidence because their next two league games are City and Villa, um, which are going to be tough games. So um, yeah, it was really really important for the whole football club and obviously for bragging rights because the whole week leading up to the game is all about the rivalry, etc. So um, it it could turn out to be a huge win for Newcastle and. They needed to stay in the competition. Um, after going out in the Carabao, after going out in the Champions League, they needed this competition. So it was a massive result. Alan, I'm sure you, you saw the uh, the picture that the Newcastle players and staff took on the yeah. ground. Did, yeah. did you see that? Did you Absolutely. see who it was instigated by? Go Jason on. Tyndall, <laughs> wind up merchant. What was this so, picture, Micah? So this picture, <clears throat> at the end of the game, all the Newcastle players have gone over to, to their fans and they're going wild, celebrating. And then you just see, it's on social media, Jason Tyndall's like saying to someone, come here. Like, right. um, and I don't know what he's saying, come here for. And then obviously it's the, the, the camera person. So he gets all the lads together and they take a big, massive photo with the fans mm. on the pitch. <laughs> and I was just thought, it was a little bit petty. I mean, it, oh, it, come it, on. Come, What's come up on, with Alan? you, man? It, it was a little bit 6,000 Geordies who were waving their flags around. They've had to put up with all that shit all week and then they battered them why not yeah get them get them in there of course it was going to wind them up even more i love it what is the actual rivalry like up there alan because obviously i played in the manchester one i played in the uh the birmingham derby also up up the northeast what's it like i think the polite way to say is we don't like each other <laughs> 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 and it's pretty nasty but they're great games to play and i mean they might not thank me, but I, I really hope that Sunderland come up because Newcastle Sunderland games. I mean, it hasn't happened for such a long time that you do miss them because they're great games to play. So you, yeah, it's a, it's very very nasty, Michael. <laughs> the the derby's different, don't they? They differ a lot around the country. I mean, it, I think they've probably got. I don't know whether they've got more intense nowadays, or I think that's always been the, the case, hasn't it? I suppose you can get it. You can get away with a little bit more, can't you? There's a, the referees are a little bit more lenient. Um, and speaking of lenient, by the way, how good was it um, for me, anyway, personally, to watch a game without VAR? Yeah. 
And oh. that's why. That's why. I, I mean, as well as the result and the performance, I thought, oh, it's so refreshing. T- totally that. agree, can, Alan. Totally it was unbelievable agree. watching without it. It was brilliant. I've enjoyed that aspect of the championship with Leicester this season. You know, when you score, you know you scored. You don't, you know. You, there might might be the odd big mistake occasionally that would have been um, spotted by VAR, but it is refreshing and, and, and a much better experience uh, watching. Now, obviously, not all the games were without VAR in the FA Cup, although... I don't think actually there was even a mention of VAR at the um, Arsenal Liverpool game either. But that was even though there was VAR. But those, <clears throat> but the grounds outside the Premier League they didn't have VAR. And actually, I think it's quite refreshing. And it made me think actually. I was thinking a lot over the over weekend about what is the way out of this um, for VAR. And I, I, I think I think personally, and this will be completely ignored. I, I do suspect and well it's absolutely a given that we're not going to can VAR they're not going to get rid of it they're too invested in it it's too far down the road we know it's lost its way it's it's basically trying to re-ref the game almost in, in a lot of circumstances I think the only way through this is an appeal system um, like they do in other sports but it was always brought in VAR for the absolute howler, the big mistake. That's what they always said it was going to be. And yep. it's moved on from that now. It's, 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 it's anything but that. But yep. the way out of it, I think, is each side gets one challenge a game. One. If you, if you keep that challenge, if, you, if you're correct with that challenge and, you, and, and it's, this decision's overturned, you get to keep it. If not, you lose it. So therefore, it will... The, the teams will have to think about whether it's the captain or the manager. You can work that out. Um, or you could even have at a maximum, maybe one each half. Um, so I, I just think that that way that the players, they know when they know when there's a, a real incident. They know when there's a real foul. Obviously, you keep the, the offside and the goal line technology because I think automated offside is, is, will inevitably come and that will help massively. But that's, that's, that's my opinion. That's my, uh, what I've been thinking over the weekend. It's the only way I think we can guarantee that all it's there for is the absolute howl of the Maradona punching the goal, that kind of stuff. Yeah, well, that's what we were told it was coming in for anyway, and they were never going to re-referee the game, which has obviously changed dramatically from four years ago to now. Um, Yeah, I mean, and also I would perhaps add to that maybe a time scale because if it is clear and obvious, it shouldn't be taking two and three minutes for all that crap that we don't like. So maybe put a 30-second limit on it if you can't. Get a decision within thirty seconds. You stick with the referee's decision, but yeah, it's not going away, is it? It's, they're not. They're not going to bin it. Should we start a petition, guys? Well, I, I'm not sure petitions really work, but they they have enough. I think if you get a hundred thousand um, signatures, then uh, then it has to go before um, before Parliament, um, and then they bugger it up anyway. So. <laughs> <laughs> Don't get involved in the politics, Michael. No politics, no politics, not on this part. part. Alan, did you know that was the first time that Newcastle had beaten Sunderland in about 10 goes? Yeah, I did, yeah. Yeah, Yeah, it was, um, and it was much needed as well, but I was aware of that, yeah. (laughs) I saw Man City surprisingly cruise to to victory. Another couple of goals for Phil Foden, but I I wanted to bring that up um, really because Kevin De Bruyne was back (laughs) on the field. Came. I mean, that's a that's a massive fillip to them, isn't it? Just just at the start of the of of January as they come into those closing months, Micah. It's it's just brilliant for for Man City. Doku back also. I was I was looking at the position and the positions Kevin De Bruyne was picking up when he came on the field, and he was like I thought he was. He was sort of playing down that right channel, and he gets an assist as well. Lovely movement, lovely play. Dinks went over to, for Doku just to, to stick away. And, and Man City now, they look, I know there was only playing, no respect to, to Huddersfield at home, but I can't see anyone stopping them now. Everyone's fit now. They've got so many variety, so many different options. They're going to be hard to beat. They really are. Don't rule Liverpool out, man. Liverpool yesterday without Van Dijk, without Salah, mm. they just, I mean, they found a way. Say whatever you want about Arsenal and the missed chances, but... 
they just found a way. They were much better in the second half. He changed it a little bit by putting Nunez on the uh, on the left side. And and did you see when he brought the two youngsters on as well in I the was, last sort of yeah. ten or fifteen minutes, Jurgen Klopp? And, um, it was nil nil at the time as well. Nil nil at the time, and I thought that both of them were superb when the uh, when they came on. I think there may be an ele- element of that to see. You know what? We're just going to go for it here. We don't really we don't want the draw because of the, that'll mess their um, their winter break weekend up because they would have had to go into a replay a week on Wednesday. Um, and I just thought, Klopp thought, I'm just going to go for it here. And it was brilliant. And there were two youngsters coming on. Yeah, superb. you played with um, one of their dads you'd have played yeah. with, wouldn't you? Lee Clark, yeah. Bobby yeah. Clark, he came on. Um, Did, were you aware that he had a kid that was yeah. talented? He yeah, he started off He started off at the Newcastle Academy ah. um, and then went to Liverpool maybe, what, 18 months, a couple of years ago, something like that. Um and yeah, I was aware of it. Yeah, I was when I saw his name on the uh, on the bench that um, there was going to be a chance that he uh, that he could get on. Far better looking than his dad. <laughs> <laughs> uh, that's that's a bit harsh. Um... <laughs> but yeah, Liverpool, Micah, don't rule them out without playing particularly well. They just keep on finding a way. No, I would never rule Liverpool out. I think uh, I said a couple of weeks ago. I think they're the ones to to challenge Man City for the league. But I just think they're still giving up a lot of opportunities. If you look at the game yesterday, Arsenal should have scored at least two in in that first half, if you're being honest. And I think the difference between Arsenal and Man City is, is Man City will punish you. So if you give them chances, they will take them. That's the only difference. And yeah, with Haaland to come back as well, like I said, Doku back and now De Bruyne, they've just got they've got too much talent in them forward areas. It's not fair. It's not fair, <laughs> is it? Really, I think I I agree with you, Alan. I think Liverpool will, will push them close as long as they don't get too many injuries. Um, oh, so you you're not saying Arsenal now? You're not saying Arsenal? Arsenal are no longer in it? Is, is that what you're Arsenal are very much in it, Micah. Oh, okay. But we just I'm talk, just checking because you you tipped Arsenal. Is all I'm saying. I did, <laughs> I did, and I'm not I'm not taking it. Liverpool back. semi-final I'm, Carabao, top of the league, next round of the FA Cup, probably favourites in Europe. What a season Incredible. Favourites what? Hmm? Who's favourites in Europe? Liverpool in their competition. Yeah. Oh, oh okay. Yeah. Europa League. Were you just going to jump on me there? No, I, 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 I'm <laughs> right. just double checking what you said, okay. that's all. I think, I think he was, Al. I think he was... He was, he was he, just ready to pounce, wasn't he? <laughs> was. he a rick. I think you got your back to goal, Alan, and you were, you were shielding it. And then the, <laughs> might, the mighty lettuce came in from behind. <laughs> and... <laughs> <laughs> Uh, what about Patrick Bamford's goal? That's got to be Ooh. goal of the weekend. Um, oh, for those that didn't see it, um, the ball was knocked up high ball. He kind of turned, chested it round and and volleyed it with the left foot right into the top corner. I think I'll let you boys explain that. Strikers, talk, talk us through the technique. I can't. I can't. It's way too far out for me. I never scored one it was like that. Absolutely magnificent, wasn't it? The uh, the technique, the touch, and then the execution. Wow, what a what a strike it was! It was unbelievable. Goal of the weekend, without a doubt. Could be goal of the season. Mm, absolute beauty. Um, Better than Ganachos? Oh, um, different, different. I mean, how do you compare skill. one kind of goal against another kind of goal? It's it's the hardest. It's, yeah. it's, I think it's, yeah. Yeah. What I, is I the would most say, what, what, is, what is the hardest to do? Well, let's put it this way. I think from a person perspective, I couldn't score either of them. <laughs> 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 no, I just got one, two overhead. I think the overhead kick one you can get and then you need a little bit. The time has got to be right. You need to absolutely strike it cleanly, but that is very doable. The other one turn and a left foot volley from what twenty five yards. Um, I don't think there's a lot in it. Um, I think the Garnacho what the overhead kick always looks the more spectacular, doesn't it? And I think that's, that's something. But um, I don't know. I don't yeah, know. they're both brilliant. Yeah. yeah, it was a great goal. Yeah, it certainly was. Um, not too many upsets in, in in the competition in the third round because we have had a few in in recent times. But I've noted. I don't. I don't know whether you both agree that having gone through a period of quite a few years of seeing reserve team after reserve team after reserve team and not just talking about the big clubs but also perhaps you know the the teams in the lower 
echelons of the Premier League and even the Championship, putting out reserve. I've noticed that teams seem to be playing a lot stronger lineups. Have you seen that? Well, I was pleasantly surprised yesterday with Liverpool and Arsenal, the teams that um, that they put out, because we've been to those games, Gary. Where you're right, it has been a, and I've been I've been rather critical of it over the uh, over the years, but. I just, I was, yeah, I liked what I saw yesterday. Um, I mean, Liverpool, other than Van Dijk, who was ill, yeah. um, that was pretty much as strong as they could be. Um, I know Arsenal made one or two changes, but I was pleasantly surprised with both teams putting the teams out there. Yeah, they did because it was such an important game for both of them. Um, but yeah, it's it's good to see, isn't it? I like it because I'm I'm not with the squads that they've that they've got that and. Also now with the winter break. I was going that, to make that point because I think that might be one of the reasons. I know it's not a yeah. proper winter break really, but they do give each club a kind of weekend off and they have that little spell. Um, I think maybe that is, um, it's, a, it's a welcome addition, I must say. It's, I, think it, I think fans find it frustrating as well. You go to a game, you want to support your team, you're playing an FA Cup, which means a hell of a lot to football fans in this country. Um, and you understand why they might want to rest one or two players. Perhaps the odd one needs a break. But, you know, that widespread thing where most teams will play pretty much a reserved side. I hope that's very much a thing of the past. Yep, agree. Hopefully. I, I think you mentioned it earlier and, and perhaps because of the stronger sides, there wasn't one Premier League side knocked out by lower league opposition. It's an unusual one, Micah. Yeah, I mean... Like you just said, I think it's a serious composition, uh, competition. The FA Cup is brilliant, isn't it? I mean, for all, the Premier League is, is fantastic. European football is great as well. But the FA Cup, it's the oldest cup in history, isn't it? With, with all the tradition and you get to see some young players given a chance, married up with the quality. I just go back to your point with the sort of winter break. I just really hope that helps as well. You know, we've got Euros at the end of the season. Um, but I just think people are respecting the competition more because they know how valuable it is now. It is difficult sometimes when you've got a big squad and someone's not playing, you always give, you know, a, a person opportunity in the earlier rounds. But as soon as you get to quarterfinals and semifinals, you always pick your, your strongest team anyway. And I think people are just respecting the, the competition as they should. I must add, though, of course, um, this podcast was recorded Monday morning it'll hopefully with you in a, a couple of hours and then Wigan play Manchester United tonight and well who knows with Manchester United at the moment whether <laughs> that, that could possibly be a surprise chaps look at Micah laughing maybe maybe I mean yeah, I, I think they've got enough to beat Wigan but the magic of the cup it's it's brought a couple of good things already at Maidstone as well but yeah I, I think they've got enough to beat Wigan but who knows we shall see. Uh, moment of the weekend. Um, we don't often give much credit to goalkeepers on this podcast, although um, we did, of course, um, give moment of the weekend to a goalkeeper for scoring a spectacular goal from about 40 yards last week. Yeah. But Cameron Dawson, the Sheffield Wednesday goalkeeper, saved two penalties in three minutes during his team's win uh, against Cardiff. Um, Sheffield Wednesday were already 1-0 up after a second-minute goal from Josh Windass. Um, he saved Ryan Wintle's penalty in the fourth minute, then saved uh, from Callum Robinson's penalty in the seventh minute. Um, that's almost like a, a shootout. You don't see that very often, do you? And there were two good saves as well, by the way, weren't they? I mean, the first one in particular. Brilliant, yeah. weren't they? Yeah. Yeah, great saves. And they went on to uh, to win the game as well. Yeah. So, yeah, important, really important and Impressive. Did you see the reaction to the first one though? So like when he saved the first one, it went up in the air. Yeah. And I wouldn't say it's lucky, but the way he was just so relaxed, he didn't <laughs> panic, waited the ball for the ball to come down in his, in his arms and was just cool with it. So yeah, <laughs> yeah. amazing. We don't want to Great give goalkeepers uh, too much credit. So we'll make it a joint um, <laughs> moment of the weekend with Patrick Bamford's goal. Okay. Well, Philbert's joined us for the uh, final hurrah and he wants us to mention Maidstone from the sixth tier who made it through. Um, 
Brilliant effort from them. And um, let's hope they get a fabulous fourth round draw. Uh, that's it from us uh, for today. We'll be back with the uh, question answer episode uh, later in the week. Uh, but for now, bye from me. I'm Philbert. <laughs> Goodbye from me. Goodbye from me. Have a good week. 